And we're very warm welcome to everybody this morning. Welcome to you all up in the uh, balconies. Uh, I think there's quite a few of you up there as well. So it's great to, great to see you. This is the fourth session in our series about worship. Over the last few weeks we've been uh, speaking about and thinking about worship. What worship means when we, not only when we come to the church here on Sunday, but also uh, as Christians, as followers of Jesus in our lives. And the first week, Tim spoke about worship as a lifestyle. The second week, I spoke about worship as devotion. And last week, Robin shared with us about worship as surrender. And this week, the subject of the thought is worship as warfare. Now, you might be thinking, what on earth is, is that all about? Uh, hopefully it will become a bit clearer as we go on. But to begin this morning, I just wanted to uh, take Freddie. Is Freddie there? Yeah? Freddie, I just want to take Freddie in my arms here. I have tried this out already and he was okay with it. <laughs> Hi Freddie. Freddie's going to be baptised later on today. And Freddie, well babies are just amazing aren't they? This is, this is Freddie of course and uh, he is a wonderful baby. And as all babies are, uh, and all, as all of us are, we're, we're born with a unique DNA. And of course in that DNA is everything that we need to become the people that we're meant to be humanly. And I just had Freddie back now uh, because he's starting to get a little bit uh, nervous of me holding him. Although I'll have to hold him again for the baptism. But we have everything in us to become the people that, we're, that God made us to be in terms of our humanity and our, our physical gifts, our mental gifts, uh, lots of aspects of our personality. And then Rick Joseph has just read to us from John chapter 1 verse, well one of the verses, verse 12, where it says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And that's referring not only to our physical birth, which of course, Freddie is a, a human physical baby. Uh, we are all physical beings that are being born physically. But it's also referring to being, made, to being born of God, to being born again in the spirit. And that's what has to happen to us if we're to become followers of Jesus. We are born again. We're born not just physically, but also spiritually. And so when we're born again, God puts into us a spiritual DNA. And that spiritual DNA, God's Spirit coming into contact with our spirit and joining with us, means that we have everything in us to be the spiritual beings that God wants us to be. To be complete human beings because we are also spiritually born again as well as physically born. And it was of course uh, Jesus who spoke to Nicodemus where he asked the question, well, you know, how can a person be born again when they've been born once in their mother's, from their mother's womb? And Jesus said, you must be born again of the Spirit. And just as, as we go on, I just want to quickly switch on to my PowerPoint here, which has got a, an illustration on it. And so there on the screen you'll see, yes, the, the scripture that I just read to you, which is, yet yeah, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent or human decision or our husband's will, but born of God. And so later on in the service, of course, the godparents and the parents will make promises because Freddie's just a little baby, but they will make promises. Uh, he's a little baby, as I said, with everything in him to be the human being that God wants him to be. But as he is baptized, his parents, because he's very young, will make promises on his behalf. And then when he gets older, he will have the opportunity to be confirmed uh, and, and as an adult and to take on that, that, that responsibility of faith in his own right. But in the meantime, as parents, 
do that for him and we'll have to point him in the right direction. And so in the book of First Peter chapter 1 it says this, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. As we think about worship this morning, worship we, as warfare, we need to acknowledge that worship is actually a war. I mentioned surrender, devotion and lifestyle uh, a few moments ago. And as we thought about surrendering our lives to God, as we thought about what we love to devote our lives to, as we thought about our lifestyle, we were thinking about what the kind of things that we put in the place of God. In other words, we put substitutes often in God's place. And But the, the, the sad truth is that when we put something else in God's place, it will not satisfy. It will not, it will not satisfy us in our lives. But as Christians, we are we are living lives for God. And so our lives, through the things we do, the things we say, the way we live our lives, everything we do in one sense or other is worship. In one sense or other it is pushing back the darkness. Uh, the darkness which came into the world at the fall. When Adam and Eve uh, disobeyed God, they made an agreement with, with each other that they would do the one thing that God said they shouldn't do. And as they did that, darkness and evil came into the world. But as Christians born again, we have the opportunity to, <coughs> to push back the darkness as we walk through our lives, as we live our lives to Jesus. That's what it means to be born again in the Spirit, to live a new life, to be a new creation, to live a life for God. It's going to push back the darkness and bring light into the world. And it's not something that we just do when things are difficult. It's something that we do every day. Because we are, and this is getting to the point about being worshipping a warfare, being warfare, it, we are actually, as Christians, on active service. We are on active service. Worship is a war, as I said. And as Christians, we're fighting that war. And that involves taking it seriously. If you were involved in a war, and in fact, in some respects, over the last few months, uh, the government is, you know, and, and, and generally the population, in a sense, have been at war with this terrible virus. It's a, a form of war in itself, uh, as the NHS and as, as, as scientists have you know, conducted research to try and overcome the, this virus. And of course, over the centuries, we've seen wars, haven't we? Uh, and when a country is at war, it involves great sacrifice, it involves great tragedy, but it not has to be taken seriously. And so we as Christians need to take seriously that we are in a war. That there is an enemy. And the enemy wants to do everything in their power to stop us from worshipping God. When we push God away from the centre as the loving creator, we're tempted to put other gods in his place. And we've been thinking about that over the last few weeks. We could call them idols. Substitutes, as I said, that never satisfy. Not only will they never fight our battles, never mind win them, they actually will act idols capture and consume us. They become the very things that we battle against. Well, that's what a false god is, because a false god will not ever satisfy, it will never provide what we need. Whatever that thing might be. The enemy uses those idols to undermine the work of God in our lives. And unless we realize that, then we'll just keep 
Who sings battle after battle? Worship is a different kind of war. It's a different kind of war from the kind of war that we might expect. And so what kind of war is it? Well, on the screen you'll see that the words of church is insurgent. Well, I was just thinking about this and I read uh, from a book that I brought, which I must confess I haven't actually read it yet, but I really think I must read this book. It's by a guy called uh, Bob Ekblad, and he's involved in working in prisons in the United States, in Washington State. And uh, he's seen amazing transformation in the lives of prisoners as they become followers of Jesus. And this is what he says. He says, Jesus was born into a world marked by oppression and injustice to announce and embody God's global liberation movement. Like an insurgent, Jesus comes in under the radar, behind enemy lines, and then builds a foundation of trust with a growing entourage of humble followers. He incites a revolution that he calls the kingdom of God. The church is like a number of insurgents, in a sense, coming in under the radar, because the battle that we fight as Christians in this world, and what we call worship as warfare, or as we worship in any way that we worship, we are actually part of that battle. Um, it, it's a different kind of war, because God fights in a different way. I said a moment ago that Adam and Eve came into agreement to disobey God at the very beginning. But that wasn't the end. Because Jesus came. God had a plan to put things right. He did something about it, about evil. The evil that's in the world. Jesus defeated the enemy when he died on the cross because he rose again. And he's given us the Holy Spirit by whom we can know that we are children of God. And it says in the screen, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. But it doesn't end there. God gives us weapons to fight in this war, as shown in Ephesians chapter 6, which Agnes read to us. God doesn't destroy, but he equips us to fight the battle fight the war. God doesn't annihilate, but he empowers us. He gives us the ability to face the enemy and have victory over the enemy. The battle belongs to God. And I think that's the mistake that we often make when we have difficulties in our lives. We, we often think we, we've got to solve this problem and that we've got to fight against it. And it could be in, with another person. It could be in our workplace. It, it, there's lots of ways in which we often want to fight back when actually what the best thing that we can do is actually pray about the situation. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 12, it says what's on the screen. It says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh, flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, <coughs> against the parts of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. What's that saying is that there's another battle going on that we can't see. And that's where prayer comes in, because we can actually use prayer, we can actually pray with other people, and we can actually go to the heart of the problem. Instead of fighting out and you know, as you see a fight break out outside the pub, don't you? And it's because somebody said something and then it accelerates, it, 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 it becomes a, a massive, massive conflict. And then somebody gets hurt or even killed. Uh, but we don't necessarily have to fight in that way. Because God has given us weapons to fight with, such as prayer, to actually confront the evil in this world. And so it says there that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against an individual person. Because you find that often in organizations and families you have recurring patterns that happen. And those things just keep on happening. Because actually they just happen through different people. I've seen it here in church. You see 
problems happening over years and years and it's because one person leaves and then somebody else comes along and then they do the same thing. It's because there's patterns of behaviour that are there that are very unhealthy. And that sometimes you've just got to pray about those things and ask God to show us what the problem is. And then we can confront it and we can defeat it. Yes, Jesus has won the war. But a nation, a city, a community, a family, even a person, you or me, we can be under the influence of the enemy. And for the church and for us to take territory, territory and for things to change, the fundamental battle must be fought in the spiritual, spiritual realm and not here on the ground. And that's why it's, it's very helpful because it avoids us getting into conflicts that just become very nasty with individual people when actually we can pray about a situation. Now you may have, th talking about real wars, you recognise the Spitfire on the screen. It's why they acknowledge that the war, the Second World War, the war had to be won in the air first to prepare for the ground offensive. And it's the same in spiritual things. The spiritual battle is the battle of the air. There's so many problems, as I've mentioned, in families, communities, and organizations have their roots in things that we can't see. Repeating patterns rather than individual people. The scripture says our struggle is not against flesh and blood. And so what is the battle about? Well, not only is the church, or not, is the church a, a group of insurgents coming in under the radar, but also the church is on assignment. In Matthew 18 it says this, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The gates of Hades are the gates of hell. And what Jesus is saying is that the church is on the offensive, not on the defensive. The gates are there, but the gates will not, are going to be broken down. Because ultimately God is going to win the victory in this world over all evil when Jesus returns. And in the meantime, the church has got to be on the offensive. Because the authority of the enemy cannot withstand the church moving in the faith of Christ. And this scripture can be applied in the level of communities, churches, families, and individuals. The battle is about taking authority. And the more we worship, the more we remember where true authority lies. And worship redirects us from ourselves to God. And that's why it's good to come here. That's why it's so good that we're back here worshipping in church as a, a community of people. Because it's an opportunity for us to not focus in on ourselves. And obviously, even if you're isolating as people were over the last few months, you can become very, very depressed. But when you come here, as we've been allowed to do now, we, can, we connect with other people, other Christians. And we worship together. And sadly, we can't sing along, but we can still be ministered to and spoken to by God through the worship, through the group singing and playing to us. We can join in in our hearts, even if not with our voices. It redirects us from ourselves back to God. It helps us to put God back at the centre of our lives. Because as I said a moment ago, the idols that we put there do not satisfy. They will never satisfy. They will never fight our battles. They will never win our battles. Only God can win our battles. And so we come to church to remember who we are. To tell ourselves the truth. And it's like there are certain things that are just true. 2 plus 2 equals 4. It's a fact. 2 plus 2 equals 4. And it's the same when we come to church. We come to declare the truth, to participate in the truth, to receive the truth, to remind ourselves of the truth, of 
who Jesus is and what he's done, of who God is, the creator and maker of all. And so when we come and we take communion together, as we say on the screen now, when we read our Bibles, when we sing, when we confess to God, when we worship together, it's a powerful thing. It actually is about, that is actually what worship as warfare is all about. It's about being an active Christian in the world, about our personal Christian walk, as well as us going out and interacting and relating to other people and bringing the good news to the world. And so, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, and the old has gone. And if you were to ask the question, what does it mean to be in Christ? Well, I've got a bowl of water here, and that bowl of water is, if you imagine, is, is Christ. And if the glass is us, how can we be in Christ and Christ be in us? Well, if I put the glass into the water, is the, is the water in, is the glass in the water? And is the water in the glass? That's what it means to be in Christ. Totally in Christ. And that's what that scripture means. The old is gone, the new is, is, is here. We are new creations as we are in Christ and Christ is in us. We become new people. And so worship is a war. What kind of war? Well, God does things differently. That we need to, with God's the authority that we've been given to fight our battles, not on the ground, but in the spiritual realm, in the, in the air, the battle of the air, the, the battle that we can't see. The battle is, is, that is fought through our worship, through our living our lives, through reading our Bibles, through listening to worship music if we can't sing it, but through living active lives for God. The battle belongs to the Lord. As, uh, as Ephesians 6 reminds us, God has given us weapons to fight that battle. And what is the battle about? Well, God gives us authority to fight that battle. Because he has won the victory through Jesus Christ. And no matter what happens in the garden, whatever happens to God in, a, in Adam and Eve, and the world is under the control of the evil one, but in Jesus we have authority over the evil one. And we should not fear. We have nothing to fear. Absolutely nothing to fear. Because of the faith that we have in Jesus. And the battle involves discipline. As, as I mentioned a moment ago, it involves us. Uh, living healthy spiritual lives, living a life well for God. If you're going to run a marathon or you're going to do a, a, a strenuous physical activity, you need to train for it. And in the same way as Christians, we need to be feeding ourselves, we need to be training, we need to be exercising our muscles for God, by Bible reading, through fellowship, through prayer. And so, if you haven't joined us already, there's still one week in our prayer course, which is this Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock on Zoom. If you want to join in with that, or in September we'll be continuing with the next four sessions. That's one way of just getting deeper into God and learning more about what prayer is all about. And then, worship is a war. But when we worship God, we are involved in that war. And the victory is assured in Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for us in Jesus Christ, dying on the cross and rising from the dead. Thank you that you've won the victory over evil. Even though we see so much evil around us, we thank you that we can fight against that. We can 
fight against it with our lives, we can fight against it through, our, through the discipline of our faith, we can also fight against it with prayer, acknowledging that the battle belongs to you, and that actually we, sometimes we don't even need to do that much, we just need to trust you and to pray to you, and then we'll see victory in our lives, and also we'll see things change in our world. We ask this in Jesus' name.